Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire. And when I'm not interviewing inspiring entrepreneurs, I'm listening to Stephanie O'Brien on the Moved by Purpose podcast. God is a very powerful, influential being. So anyone that tells you that you're wrong for desiring power and influence, they are in the wrong because that goes against the nature. That is a God-given desire. Are you longing to know what your purpose is? Are you on the wrong career path? Do you feel like there must be more to life? Don't worry. There's hope. It's time to be moved by purpose. Now your host, Stephanie O'Brien. Hey, welcome to the Moved by Purpose podcast again. This is your host, Stephanie O'Brien. Thanks for joining me today. Today is going to be a little bit of kind of an audio blog. I wrote this blog yesterday, and I'm not going to be reading the entire thing verbatim. I will expound a little bit, but you can read the blog. It is titled, The Hidden Cost in a High Calling, and this is about what people are praying for, what people want or desire, and the hidden cost involved with receiving what you pray for or getting what you ask for or actually obtaining what you work for and what you want. Some of you may be thinking, how is that a bad thing? And it's not. It's really not a bad thing to get what you want and to receive blessings and answered prayer. There are wonderful things with all of that, but included with increase is greater levels of responsibility and new trials that you may not be used to. And this is not to scare anyone or intimidate them, but this is very noted throughout the Bible. The Israelites wanted deliverance from their slavery, from the oppression of the Egyptians. So God delivered them, and then they were in the desert having to make their own bread and learn how to feed themselves. That was all provided for them while they were enslaved. Now they were on their own having to learn how to do it. Now they weren't really on their own. They felt like they were on their own, but God was providing and taking care of them. It just wasn't in ways they were used to, and it wasn't in ways that was comfortable for them. But it was in ways that was best for them. And that's something you have to bear in mind when you're pressing through to get a breakthrough. That there's going to be new levels of adversity, new levels of trials, and... You just have to be prepared to face those. And they're not even anything you can really comprehend or understand because you don't know it yet. For me, one of my trials with stepping out on my own and being my own boss, as glamorous as that is or sounds like, and as sexy as entrepreneurship is these days, especially when you're working for someone else, and you don't like what you do and all you want to do is be your own boss and make all the rules and have all this freedom. And while those are so wonderful, wonderful perks of entrepreneurship, it's not as pretty and not as glamorous as you think that it is. There's a lot of responsibilities on your shoulders now. You now don't have a team. You're responsible for coming up with all of the ideas, doing all all of the work, having all of the things that go wrong be your responsibility. And then when you do add a team or hire extra help, because you will need to to grow, you're going to have to learn how to be a leader. You're going to have to learn how to juggle with different working styles, different personalities. You're going to learn about your leadership style and what works, what doesn't. And that's a learning curve. Everyone thinks that being a leader must be so great while people sit in their ivory tower. And yeah, there's some crappy leaders out there. There are people that do nothing to be in the trenches and to hear their people. But I think that a lot of leaders must like to be in the trenches. And they're not sitting in their ivory tower. Like, that's such a common phrase people use. 
And I really don't think that's the case for some of the leaders. At least I used to say that about some of the leadership I encountered. And looking back on it, I know I was completely in the wrong for saying that. I have no idea what it's like to walk in their shoes. I don't know what decisions they're having to make and the burdens they have to bear. And so when they make a decision that I don't like and I'm not 100% thrilled about, and many people aren't thrilled about, you know how hard that is to stay strong because you know it's what's best for the company or for the church or organization or for the group or whoever, for maybe even your family. Not everyone is going to be content with your decisions. Not everyone's going to be won over by your decisions. And that's the challenge of leadership. And if you want to be a leader, can you handle that? Can you handle that? You, as maybe a team member, you might get along really great with your coworkers or most people, you know, don't necessarily push back on you and you can have ideas heard, but maybe they fall on deaf ears and that's frustrating. But what if the responsibility ultimately isn't on you, but what happens when it is on you and now those team members no longer are your peers or your friends, they are people that you're responsible for. And so now they're the ones getting mad at you and pushing back on you and challenging you for your decisions. And you have to follow through on those because you know more things than they do. And they can't necessarily be informed of all of the things going on. And there's people that don't understand. Now, I think it is frustrating to not be in the know of everything. But there are some things that are just not appropriate for everyone to know. There's an appropriate time for people to be told things. But for the most part, there is kind of a need to know when you need to know it policy that many companies abide by. I mean, and that's just an example of leadership or owning your own business. But what if you want to get married? Say you're single and you really want to get married. That's a blessing. The Bible calls that a blessing. The Bible also calls being single a blessing. But I'm sure married people know that there's challenges in marriage. There's challenges with having children. And while all of those are blessings, there's also complications, challenges, difficulties, and trials that come with that blessing. So we have often heard that it has been said that God delights in when we pray really big, bold, audacious prayers. And there is there's complete truth to that and he loves to bless us and he loves to show himself mighty and powerful i have been the recipient of these miracles and answers to big bold prayers and as i was saying with those blessings there's also been a cost the dreams and the desires that i have are implanted in me they're not necessarily my dreams i believe that they are god-given desires because if it were up to me, they wouldn't be as big, I think. I mean, they're very big. They're far bigger than me. They're much greater than me. I don't think I would have personally chosen them for myself. And God is preparing me to receive all that he has for me. And that preparation phase can be a challenging one. There's a reason Moses was in the desert for 40 years. 40 is the number of preparation or probation. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years before they entered their promised land. There's a number of that 40, either 40 days, like Jesus fasted for 40 days before entering into his ministry. And there's a significant to that number. There's time. And, you know, that 40-day fast in the desert, I can tell I have a pretty strong hunch that that wasn't a peaceful, with ease and joy and great comfort time. I'm quite confident that that was an extremely trying and challenging and difficult time. He was weak, he was hungry, he was thirsty, I'm sure he was tired and worn. And then the enemy comes out to tempt him in his weakness when he's vulnerable. 
And Jesus knocks that test, he blows that test out of the water because in his greatest weakness, he remains extremely faithful to God. When Satan was tempting him and twisting and manipulating the word of God too, right? Like when you're weak and vulnerable and you're tired and and then, oh my goodness, this is how nasty Satan can be. Like he'll use the word of God. He'll use God's word to trick you, to deceive you, to manipulate you, to twist things around. And are you on your A game? Do you really know what God's word says? Do you really have that so deeply rooted in your heart that when you hear a false representation of his word, you quickly call it out and say, that is not what it really says. That is not what that really means. And people do this often. People will pull things out of God's word, pull things out. You know, some people will excuse a life of wild partying because Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. So they justify their drinking because they say if Jesus had a problem with people drinking and celebrating, he wouldn't have turned water into wine. Jesus doesn't have a problem with people having wine. He doesn't have a problem with people celebrating. But a lifestyle of drunkenness or wild promiscuity in parties, he does. And it's not even having a problem with you. It's just that it's not his best for you. And this isn't to judge or condemn anyone in that lifestyle. It's just it's not the best. It's not the safest for you. There's lots of things involved. Your health declines. You put yourself at risk of a lot of things because your judgment becomes impaired. You're just more vulnerable to attacks or maybe spending your money foolishly or just doing stupid things. You just lose your judgment and you're at risk of doing really dumb things. So it's in your best interest that you avoid doing that on a regular basis. And for those who listen and say, I see nothing wrong with it, I'm fine with it, then to each his own, that's fine. That's your decision. But moving on. Big, bold prayers. God delights in answering them. And those desires that he gives you, I mean, he gives you them. And so you know that he'll make them come to pass. But it may take a long time before they come to pass, and there's a lot of trials and difficulties, challenges that you have to overcome in order to receive that desire be manifested as a reality into your life. There's nothing wrong with increasing your income and impact and influence. They're totally harmless things to pray for and to desire or to even expect in your life because that is in God's will to give to you. He loves to increase you. He doesn't like idle hands. He actually takes idle hands or idle wealth or people that are not expanding and increasing and multiplying is not God's will at all. Staying stagnant, staying complacent, just staying where you are without increasing, without growing, without expanding, without improving, are not in alignment with his will. So complacency and settling for mediocrity because that's where you're comfortable, that's not the life God created you to live. And it's not pleasing to him if you choose to stay in there. It's one thing to feel like you're in a desert season or feel like you're stuck, or feel like you're in stagnation, but you're actually growing. You're actually growing. There's a lot of growth happening. As long as you are intentionally making steps to grow, even if it feels like there's no results, no growth, there's a lot happening internally. And that's different than deliberately choosing not to grow, not to develop, and not to expand, because you like things the way they are and you're completely okay with things being the way they are and you have no plans on making things any different but God's got very big plans in store for you which is why he delights when you pray big bold and audacious prayers and when I began my big bold prayer journey oh my god did I have so much to learn there were many changing seasons in my life 
through this whole prayer journey. And as I mentioned, stagnation or a desert dry season, I've gone through heartbreak, lack, I've experienced abundance, I've experienced joy, stagnation, loneliness, companionship. I've experienced a lot of things, and I'm sure I'll experience even more things. I'm pretty young in life, and I believe I have a whole lot of life ahead of me, and there's going to be a whole lot more lessons to learn as I grow. And through all of these changing seasons, I have actually grown closer to my Creator. I know about who He is and what His name means now more than ever before. And now I know that I will continue to know Him in even greater ways throughout my life. And I look forward to that. But there is a lesson that I learned and had to accept about praying and believing big. And that was what I already mentioned earlier. Big, bold prayers require big, bold courage. And when you pray for God to increase your faith, something that he delights and loves to answer because faith pleases him, you need to be prepared to be stretched to the very end of yourself. And when you think you cannot bear it one more second, more resistance, adversity, and confusion and pressure end up coming against you because faith is developed through a resisting force and that's the lesson I learned with that knowledge I'm at a crossroad do I continue pressing in and believing that he'll answer every bold promise he spoke or do I choose to say it's too much for me to bear and what I have to go through to prepare to even bear that load is too great and so I choose to go a different way. And the choice is, is up to me. I can ask him to change his mind. I can ask him to reroute. Or I can receive all of the blessings he has in store with my name on it and go through what he needs, he has planned for me to go through in order to receive all that he's got. I know now that the blessing comes with a cost. A high calling has a high cost affiliated with it. So the choice is up to you. You notice the adversity the moment you even begin to step out to fulfill your purpose or to answer the call to something greater, to an expansion and to a growth and to increase because that is God's will for you. You talk about your dreams and people instantly shut them down. Are you going to listen to everyone who says your dreams are not based in reality? Are you going to be moved by what you see and feel? Or are you going to walk by faith and not by sight? The bigger your prayer life gets, the bigger your dreams grow, as well as the bigger the giant becomes that you have to slay. The more you have to work, and the more you have to risk, and the more discomfort you will feel and experience while that prayer is manifested and answered in your life. If you have a dream to reach the masses and to influence many lives, that's a beautiful dream. But realize that there is a responsibility that comes with it. I personally think there are are many people that want power, they want to have fame and fortune, they want to be in a top leadership role, and there's nothing wrong with these desires in and of themselves. But there's a high cost to all of those things. As I mentioned, leadership is not easy. Having power has great responsibility, as I'll pull a, a Spider-Man quote. And fame and fortune, while that might look glamorous to some, the fame part doesn't, but the fortune does. <laughs> I'm okay with the fortune. I can leave the fame. But <laughs> either way, usually they go hand in hand because when you do have a very successful business and you're very affluent, let's say you have a billion-dollar business, you're going to be known in the public. Like They're just going to know who you are. <laughs> Because you built such, it's so widely known. Your name most likely will be a household name. 
And if you want to be in a position of power and influence, and again, never feel guilty for desiring this. That desire is a God-given desire. We are made in the image of God. God is a very powerful, influential being. So anyone that tells you that you're wrong for desiring power and influence, they are in the wrong because that goes against the nature. That is a God-given desire. Now to keep it in check, the motives behind it, the why, and the reason behind it, is it to, is it for vengeance? Is it to get people back? Is it motivated by pride and to show people how they were wrong if they made fun of you? Is it in a wrongful way? That's wrong, but the desire itself is not wrong. But you need to be strong enough to resist the corruption and the temptation that go with it. If power and influence were wrong, Jesus wouldn't have been a person of power and influence. I'm just saying, if fame and fortune were wrong, Jesus was very famous. Jesus was very famous. And while I wouldn't say that he was necessarily a king, like, well, he is a king, but a king in the sense that they understood a king like King David or King Solomon. His ministry had money. Oh, yeah, he had money. He had a treasurer managing money, managing accounts. Judas managed the accounts, so much so that he could embezzle some money without them even noticing it. So it doesn't sound like they were in a whole lot of lack. It didn't sound like they were struggling. And many of the people that he rolled with were very, very affluent, wealthy people. That story of the woman breaking the jar of perfume or incense that was a year's wages. I mean, like that. these people had things of wealth and things of value. So feeding the 12 disciples took money, took resources, making sure that they were clothed and fed and had shelter and all of that. So I think a lot of people think Jesus was poor because there's a scripture that says he was poor He or something like that. Jesus was poor. He became poor. Oh, that's it. He became poor so we could become rich. He's talking about spiritually. He took on the sin of the world so that we can gain the wealth of the kingdom, the richness of his glory. For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That spiritual riches. He became spiritually poor, depleted of life, taking on sin so that we can be free of sin. That's what that means. That doesn't mean. That doesn't mean he was poor materially or financially. And Joseph being a carpenter, I'm not sure why people make the assumption that Joseph was a poor carpenter. I mean, he worked. He had business. That's how he made his income. It's like saying a landscaper is poor. Not all landscapers are poor. I know multi-millionaire landscapers. So, yeah. And not to mention that the gifts that Jesus was brought from the three astrologers. Well, I don't even know if there were three. I think that's a Christmas thing. I don't remember. I got to actually recall the story <laughs> but there were wise kings there were a group of wise men that came and gifts to jesus and those were worth a fortune so right off the bat there was provision and wealth for his family but anyway i digress so that was just my my thing to fight the belief that jesus was poor and had nothing and that somehow you're more righteous or more christ-like to have nothing and to be poor unless you have a specific call and anointing on your life to give live voluntarily in poverty like mother Teresa and certain people are gifted and have a special anointing there's ease with it, and there's no desire for material wealth. There's no desire for more. But most people don't have that call. They don't have that anointing. And we desire more. We desire to have abundance because we are meant to have abundance. And you might be thinking, well, Stephanie, what about the prayer, give us this day our daily bread? And, you know, where God says he's enough, he's our source. He absolutely is enough, and he absolutely is our source. And that daily bread was to show that we are to be dependent on him daily. We are to come to him daily for our provision. And that was manifested through 
food then, through manna then, to teach them a dependence. But there are people that I know that are very, very wealthy that have a total dependence on God. And they've got more than enough in their bank account because they have a daily dependence on Him for their spiritual food, their spiritual nourishment. He is our daily source. He is our food. He quenches our thirst. He is the water that we have where we will never thirst again. He's not talking literal food, literal water, but he's talking about how fulfilling and complete we can be if we abide in him. Okay, so now that I have said that, and anyone that disagreeing with what I say or coming up with objections, hopefully I covered most, but, you know, if you disagree, you can always email me and let me know your thoughts. Anyway, so back to the power and influence. So if you want to be in a position of power and influence, you need to be strong enough to resist the corruption and the temptation that goes with it. And if you want fame and fortune, be prepared for a massive life change. Your privacy goes out the door. And to protect the little privacy that you do get, you actually have to pay some pretty big bucks for it. Those security guards, bodyguards, all those people locking down, you know, the surveillance systems in for your house. I'm sure you have to have all of your computer and devices like extra, extra secure because you're a higher name that people can target. And I don't write this to discourage you or to scare you at all, but this is just to make, and this isn't to feed a fear of success or to encourage you to be playing small either. It's just the reality you will face. So be aware of it and be prepared for it. And if you're struggling through a certain season, realize that what you're going through now is preparing you for greater things. And you need to trust in God. Trust that he knows what he's doing. And when you pray big, you'll also face big adversity. The more you gain, the more you have to manage. That's why God has said in his word, those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much. He also encourages us to not despise the day of small things. And I used to be so impatient with the day of small things. Oh my goodness, I couldn't stand it. But as I have increased and grown, and I know I haven't even gotten it, I know there's much expansion and much growth to still be had. But as I've grown, I've actually seen the gift and the treasure in the small things. These small things are your training season. They're your training wheels. It's your preparation to handle the big things. And it's your chance to prove to yourself that you are equipped to bear a greater load. Life does not get easier when you advance and increase. It doesn't get more comfortable as your faith develops and increases. It actually gets harder. And in the book, The Circle Maker, written by Mark Batterson, he wrote, God will keep putting you in situations that stretch your faith. And as your faith stretches, so do your dreams. If you pass the test, you graduate to bigger and bigger dreams. And it won't get easier. It'll get harder. And the choice is up to you. Do you want to run that multi-million dollar business? Do you want to grow your church? Do you want to obtain that promotion? Then be willing to pray harder than you've ever prayed and to work harder than you've ever worked. And not just pray, work. Faith without works is dead. Faith requires action. And you have to take a step in faith and walk by faith. Even when you see nothing happening. God is faithful. The question is, will you be? And I'm finishing it off with that powerful question to ponder. Thank you again for checking in. If you haven't done so already, I am glad to announce that the Mastering Your Mindset seminar is reduced to $99 for the whole day. Plus, you get delicious food included. So make sure that you sign up before October Oh, goodness, this is getting promoted on October 26th. 
Well, the price will go up to 179 by the time you hear it, which is still a significantly reduced price. So if you've been thinking about it, I slashed the price to be more accessible and affordable for people. So if you've been questioning, now is your time to jump on board and say, I am in. And I'm so excited to meet you. If you've been listening, I'm really excited to see your faces and to really get to know who you are. I've Some of you have been emailing me. I've even spoken to some on the phone. But to actually physically meet in person, that's really something I'm looking forward to. And that is the Mastering Your Mindset Seminar. That's right on the MoveByPurpose.net homepage. Just click that image and it links you right over to where you can register and gives you even more information that you need. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you could subscribe, rate, and write a review on this podcast and share it with your friends. If you've been getting blessed and benefited with this content every week, I'd love it if you could just take a moment, if you haven't done so already, and take the time, five minutes of your time, to do that. I know a lot of you are listening in your car, on a run, you know, doing other things, but just take a moment. You can do it right on your phone. It's super, super simple and easy, and that would be a big blessing to me and much appreciated because it helps get the word out. More people get help. It helps expand the Move by Purpose, and more people get to hear this great message. I know this was more of a spiritually heavy podcast, so if you're not a person of faith and didn't care for it, you I probably didn't keep you for as long as I did. So for those who stayed along, thank you for staying along. And remember that you are created with a purpose. You are significant. You value and you matter. Don't listen to the lies that tell you anything different. And go out there and make a difference. He took on the sin of the world so that we can gain the wealth of the kingdom, the richness of his glory. For my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus.